Hi, this is George from The Return of the King. If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button. Comments are reviewed for about 24 hours. Try and keep them short. I can't publish and review them all because there's just too many. To really understand all the things I present, you have to watch all of the latest videos. There's a link in the upper right corner for a playlist of those videos, and there'll be another link at the end of this video. In this video, I'm going to talk about why Pentecost is the only feast day that can be associated with the rapture. All the other appointed times and feasts have to do with Israel. Pentecost is a type or foreshadowing of the church age. It is not connected to anything in Israel's history. It was only in 140 AD that the Jewish court shifted the theme of Pentecost from a harvest feast to that of the giving of the law to Moses. The reason the church began on Pentecost so that we would know that this feast is about the church, the church age, the age of grace, not Israel. Feast days are about harvests and resurrections, not births. There are seven appointed times, of which three are true feast days. The Jewish calendar in use today and at the time of Christ cannot give you the correct day of Pentecost. At the time of Christ, the Jewish calendar was a mixture of the calendar revealed to Moses and the calendar used by the Romans, and today it's even worse. It's a modernized but yet a more complex Jewish calendar mixed with the Gregorian calendar. The Sabbaths used at the time of Christ were taken from the calendar in use by the Romans and today from the Gregorian calendar. There are enough clues in the Bible to figure out exactly how the calendar worked at the time of Moses. It's very simple and logical, nothing like the complicated calculations used by the Jews today. I'll go over that later in this video. The three true feast days are the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Harvest, also known as Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. It's on these three feasts all males are required to attend. They are meetings with God. Three times in the year you shall keep a feast to me. You shall keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. As I commanded you, you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall keep the feast of harvest, of the first fruits of your labor, of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God. The feast of harvest, of the first fruits, is Pentecost. The feast of ingathering is also called the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. The Feast of Unleavened Bread and Pentecost are connected to one another in several ways. Both have wave offerings. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a sample of the harvest to come is waved up to and before the Lord. A sheaf is a bundle of grain like you see here. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. This offering was the first fruits of the greater harvest to come later at Pentecost. The day of the first fruits offering is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And Matthew 27, 52 tells us that many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. This is why the offering is not a single stock, but many stocks bundled together. This is the first of three resurrections of the righteous. The second resurrection will occur at the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost. Paul, speaking about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, says this, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. When Paul says, at his coming, those who belong to Christ, he's speaking of the rapture. On Pentecost, the Feast of Harvest, two loaves of bread made up of the same grain that was sampled on the Feast of Unleavened Bread are to be waved before the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made up of two-tenths of an ephah, there shall be a fine flour, there shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord, with the two lambs. 
They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. If the Feast of Unleavened Bread is about resurrections, then the concluding feast, the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost, must also be about resurrections. Since the grain used in the bread is of the same grain as the first fruits offering. The church was born on Pentecost. The theme of Pentecost is not birth, but harvest. It's a prophetic feast. It's prophetic of the church and the church age and the age of grace. The reason God had the church begin at Pentecost was to let us know that this feast is about the church, not Israel. It has nothing to do with Israel. It was a mystery feast to them. They didn't know what to do with it. So in 140 AD, following the final defeat of the Jewish nation, after the Bar Kokhba revolt of 135 AD, the Sanhedrin changed the theme of Pentecost from the summer harvest to the giving of the law. The three feasts all have a harvest theme to them. All three feasts symbolize resurrections. On the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Christ the firstfruits and the bodies of many of the saints rose. On the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost, the dead in Christ, then we who are alive shall meet the Lord in the air, the rapture. The first wave offering is about Christ's resurrection. Paul said that if Christ is not raised from the dead, we are the most to be pitied. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. But if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The second wave offering is about the rapture. The two loaves are lifted up in the air to God. They are to God and for God, symbolic of the rapture. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore encourage one another with these words. The third resurrection of the righteous occurs on the Feast of Tabernacles, also called the Feast of Ingathering. All the Old Testament and tribulation saints will be raised when Christ comes to rule and reign at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. If you want to understand the three orders of resurrection and why it is that Pentecost is associated with the rapture, I recommend two books by Jack Langford, The Threefold Order of the Resurrection of the Righteous and The Pentecostal Rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ. He covers all of this in great detail. The method used to determine the day of Pentecost is modeled after the manner used to determine the Jubilee. And you shall number to you from the next day after the Sabbath, from the day you bring in the sheaf of the wave offering, they shall be seven complete Sabbaths. The next day after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number fifty days. The starting point is the wave offering that occurs during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Harvest, Pentecost, is the natural conclusion to the first fruits offering. It's the full harvest come in. The most common name among the Jewish people for the Feast of Harvest was the Feast of Conclusion. Why is the day count modeled after the Jubilee? It's because when Pentecost is fulfilled, it's a type or foreshadowing of the Jubilee. So what is the Jubilee? And you shall count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, so that the seventh Sabbaths of years amounts to forty-nine years. Then you are to sound the horn far and wide on the tenth day of the seventh month, the Day of Atonement. You shall sound it throughout your land. So you are to consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty in the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be your jubilee when each of you is to return to his property and to his clan. At the rapture, the trumpet of God will be blown. The jubilee begins with the trumpet, sound the horn far and wide. The jubilee is about redemption. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land.
Paul in Romans says this about the redemption of our bodies. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. At the rapture we get new immortal bodies, no more pain, disease, and disability. A body that is vibrant, healthy, and strong. One that cannot perish. The appointed times, commonly called the feast days, are being fulfilled in order. Jesus was born on the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. A link will appear to a video on why Jesus was born in Tabernacles. The heavens confirm this as the feast, God tabernacling among us. Jesus dies on the cross on Passover. He's in the grave on the first day of unleavened bread. He rises from the dead on the day of the wave offering of grain, commonly called first fruits. The next feast to be fulfilled is the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost. The church was born on Pentecost so that we would know that this feast, a mystery feast, is about the church. It will be fulfilled by the rapture of the church. After the rapture, the next feast to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. The tribulation begins on trumpets with the signing or enforcement of the covenant spoken of in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we are also told the tribulation will begin with the signing of the covenant. Daniel 9.27 And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Notice what verse it is in Daniel that gives us this information. It's verse 9.27 the Feast of Trumpets begins at sunset on 927. This date for the Feast of Trumpets is based on the sighting of the new moon. This is the way it was done at the time of Christ. This is the correct method to calculate the start of months. It's what you find at TorahCalendar.com. Jesus' ministry lasted three and a half years. The Jewish leadership had three and a half years to recognize him as their king, but they did not. They will crown the Antichrist as their king, on the day that Jewish kings are crowned, Yom Terah, also known as the Feast of Trumpets, and he will reign over them for three and a half years. There are no coincidences with God. The tribulation ends on Yom Kippur when Christ returns to the Mount of Olives. The civil calendar begins in the fall on the Feast of Trumpets, also known as Rosh Hashanah, which means Head of the Year. The last feast day of the year is then the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost. So when God blows the trumpet, it will be the last trumpet of the year calling the bride home. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.20 calls us ambassadors for Christ. Before a country declares war on another, they bring their ambassadors from that country home. Before Christ declares war on this world, which will begin on the Feast of Trumpets, he will take us home. Nowhere does the scripture tell us that the last trump found in 1 Corinthians is the final trumpet blast sounded on the Feast of Trumpets. This final trump that Paul is talking about is the trump that will bring the church age, the age of grace, to a close. Trumpets are sounded at every feast. But when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow a long blast, but you shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets. The trumpets shall be to you for a perpetual statute throughout your generations. And when you go to warn your land against the adversary who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, that you may be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. On the day of your gladness also, and at your appointed feasts, the word here translated feasts in Hebrew is moed. It's more correctly translated appointed times, of which there are seven. And at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. 
They shall be a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord, your God. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. In Hebrew, the word for full moon is kesa. The word for feast is the Hebrew word chag. So this passage is telling us the moon is full on the three true feast days, that of unleavened bread, the feast of harvest, Pentecost, and tabernacles. The feast of unleavened bread and tabernacles, we are told in Leviticus, is on the 15th day of the month. On the 15th day of the month, the moon is always full. So the moon must also be full on Pentecost. This will help us determine the correct date for Pentecost, which we will look at shortly. The moon is only new on the appointed time known as the Feast of Trumpets. This is Ken Johnson speaking of the Feast of Trumpets. The Hebrew for the word day of blowing of trumpets is literally Yom Terah, the day of the awakening blast. Terah is an awakening blast from the shofar that would be the signal for an army to wake up and prepare for the day's battle. This is the day that Jesus begins to take his kingdom back, the start of the tribulation. So what is the true day of the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost? We'll start by looking at the Jewish calendar, starting on the first month of the religious calendar. First off, the Bible doesn't tell us everything we need to know to set up the calendar. This information comes from the oral law. This information was handed down from generation to generation by memory was not written down until the 3rd century AD. The start of the year on the sacred or religious calendar is when the sun is in the constellation Aries, which in Hebrew is Tale, which means the Lamb. This is confirmed by the famous Jewish historian Josephus. At the time of Moses, the equinox occurred on about April 4th in the constellation of Aries. Today it's in the constellation of Pisces on March 20th, a shift of about two weeks. The equinox is the day when the night and day are approximately equal. This is the correct starting date for this year. If you went one lunar cycle earlier, it would be too early. One cycle later, it would be too late. The months start with the sighting of the crescent moon. This is the method used by Torah calendar, which you see here. We can prove this is the correct method by looking at the location of the moon on the day that Jesus was born, died, and resurrected. If the calendar is off by just one day, the story in the heavens goes away. If the day of the rapture is off by one day, the moon will not be in the correct location. The day Jesus resurrected and the day of the rapture are linked by the symbolism of the wave sheaf offering and the wave offering of bread. The moon is in a very symbolic location on the day Jesus resurrects, and it will be in the same precise location on the day of the rapture. On the day of the rapture and the day of Christ's resurrection, the moon is above the tail of the scorpion. The scorpion represents the tribe of Dan, just like Leo represents the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Many theologians believe the Antichrist comes from the tribe of Dan. The heavens confirm this belief. The scorpion represents Satan and the beast system of Revelation. Sagittarius represents Jesus, the rider of the white horse. Revelation 19.11 Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3.8 The ancient rabbis believed the sun represented God and the moon the Messiah. God, who like the sun we cannot look at, but the Messiah, a reflection of God, whom we can the moon representing Messiah is in the constellation of the rider of the white horse, whose bow is pointed at the scorpion. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Paul, speaking of the rapture, says this, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death comes from the devil, represented by the scorpion. A resurrection of the saints occurred when Jesus resurrected, 
and it will occur again at the rapture. When the dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. We will not experience death. We will go from mortal to immortal in the twinkling of an eye. Jewish days start at sunset and end at sunset. On our calendar and the calendar in use by the Romans, the Sabbath starts at sunset Friday and ends on sunset Saturday. The Sabbaths at the time of Christ and today come from calendars designed by man. The Sabbath is not related to the sighting of the moon. The Sabbaths just roll from one week to the next. If this method came from God, it would have to track back to the seven days of creation. It wouldn't take long before the dates would be lost. Using the incorrect Sabbaths only affects the day of Pentecost and the first fruits wave offering. All the other appointed times are based on day counts from the sighting of the moon. Jesus rose from the grave on the day of the first fruits wave offering. In order for Jesus to rise on the day after the Sabbath, the first day of the week, as we are told in the Gospels, two things had to happen. The calendar in use by the Romans had to be synced to Jesus' death, and the Sadducees had to be controlled at temple, not the Pharisees. The Pharisees calculate the first fruits wave offering differently. So the day of the offering would not be on the day Jesus rose, and the typology of the first fruits offering would not have been fulfilled. Just remember, God is in control of everything, and things will happen when they are supposed to happen. When the church began on Pentecost, as we are told in the book of Acts, it was based on the calculations of the Sadducees who controlled the temple at that time. In order for us to make the connection between the church and Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit had to occur on the day determined by the temple. This is something God wanted us to know. This was not just a coincidence. Since we are in the church age, the age of grace, and there is no temple, the day of Pentecost will be turned by God, and it will be the method given to Moses by God. It also means that it was technically not fulfilled since they were not using God's calendar, but a mixed calendar. So if you're out in the desert, what would be the most logical method to calculate the Sabbaths? It's very simple. The sighting of the moon is day one, and then your Sabbaths are the 7th, the 14th, the 21st, and the 28th. Each month, then, will have exactly four Sabbaths. This month, our calendar Sabbath just happened to line up with the Sabbaths on God's calendar. When we look at the next month, we see that they have shifted over two days from the Sabbaths that just continue rolling from one week to the next. Your Sabbaths are the 7th, the 14th, the 21st, and the 28th day from the sighting of the crescent moon, which is day one. It's this method of calculating the Sabbaths that will give us the correct day of Pentecost. All three feasts are meetings with God. All males are required to attend. Two of the three, we are told, are on the 15th, when the moon is full. So to maintain the typology of the first two feasts, that of meetings with God when the moon is full, which it is on the 15th. The third feast, the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost, should also be on the 15th day of the month. When the day of the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost, is calculated correctly, all three of these biblical requirements will be fulfilled. And you shall number to you from the next day after the Sabbath, from the day you bring in the sheaf of the wave offering. They shall be seven complete Sabbaths, the next day after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days. Psalm 81.3 tells us the moon is full on three of the feast days. Below the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. This verse from Deuteronomy 16, 9 and 10 tells us when to start counting the Sabbaths. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. All the males are meeting with God during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's a holy week, so no one should be out harvesting yet. As soon as the Feast of Unleavened Bread is over, they can start the harvest. So the earliest we can start the count is the Sabbath after the Feast of Unleavened Bread has concluded. This is the first month on the Jewish calendar this year, 2022. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is from the 15th to the 21st. We need to fulfill both Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16.9.
we need to count seven Sabbaths and start the count on the next Sabbath after the Feast of Unleavened Bread has concluded. So we're going to start here. This is our first Sabbath. Sighting of the Crescent Moon is on day one. And this is our second Sabbath, third, fourth, and our fifth Sabbath in the second month. This is the third month. We have the sighting of the crescent moon. This is day one. Our sixth Sabbath is day seven. And our seventh Sabbath is day 14. So we have our seven complete Sabbaths. And the next day after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number. The word translated number in Hebrew means to mark or to score. Mark the following day, the 50th day. This approach to calculating the day of Pentecost is simple and logical and fulfills all of the Bible's requirements for this day. It's the 15th day of the third month and the moon is full. All the appointed times except the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Terah, occur when the moon is full. I'm defining a full moon as the moon being 90% or better illuminated. When Jesus is born, the moon is in the constellation of Aries, Tale in Hebrew, the Lamb. Venus, the bright morning star, is in the womb of Virgo. The moon is 98% illuminated. The moon is at least 93% illuminated on all the appointed times except the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Terah, when it's new. Theologians since the beginning have speculated on the meaning of the 153 fish. Why this exact number? We know it's there for a purpose, but what? The account of the 153 fish is a type or foreshadowing of the rapture. In order to see this account as a type of the rapture, we first have to be told what the rapture is. Once we are told what the rapture is, we can go back and look at this account and see the symbolism. The Passover is a type or foreshadowing of the atonement. Christ's death on the cross, saving us from death and God's judgment. On Passover, they killed the lamb and painted the blood on the doorposts of their homes. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you. You can't look at what happened on Passover and predict that God will send his son and have him crucified on a cross to pay the price for our sins and protect us from judgment and death. Types are hidden prophecies that will not be understood or even seen until they are fulfilled. The fulfillment of the type is called the anti-type. Once Jesus goes to the cross on the day of Passover, the symbolism becomes crystal clear. On Passover, they killed the lamb and painted the doorposts with its blood. The fulfillment of this occurred when Jesus sheds his blood on a wooden cross on Passover, fulfilling the type. The blood of the lamb on the doorpost protected the firstborn of the Israelites from death. The blood of the lamb, Jesus, protects those who put their faith in him from the coming judgment and death. The account of the 153 fish is similar to Passover. You can't read this account and then come to the conclusion that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, the rapture. But once you learn of the rapture and what it is, you can see the symbolism in the account of the 153 fish. What is the account of the 153 fish all about? I'll let Gary Stearman and J.R. Church tell you. Prophecy by James Harrison. J.R., the number 153, I just have to say that when Jesus stood on that shore, prepared breakfast, fire of coals, what you have is a complete metaphor for the end of the age. Mm -hmm. You have the sea of humanity, the net full of fish, the fire on the coals, which may be emblematic of the tribulation fire prior to the coming of the kingdom. It says the 153 fish are saved from that tribulation saved fire. Saved from that tribulation fire. What do you Free think about that? tribulation rapture, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and it's on the morning of the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples. That's encouraging. To me, that says that sometime in the next few years, just before the turn or around the turn of the millennium, uh, at the dawning of the third millennium of human history, we can expect to be gathered in. Once the rapture is revealed by Paul in 50 AD, we can look back at this account, which occurred in 32 AD, and see the symbolism of the rapture. 
Once you have the correct date for Pentecost, the 15th day of the third month on the Jewish calendar, you can look at the account of the 153 fish and see the connection. The exact count of 153 fish is confirming to us that Jesus is coming to take his bride home some year on Pentecost. There's nothing shocking or unusual here at all. It's the next feast day to be fulfilled. It's the feast day that was a mystery feast to the Jews. When we look at the two feast days that we are told occur on the 15th day of the month, it's the day first and then the month. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Fifteenth day of the first month. One, five, one. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be a feast of booths seven days to the Lord. Fifteenth day, seventh month. The number 157. The other two feasts start with the day and then the month. So then Pentecost is on the 15th day of the third month. The number 153. In the Bible, the number 3 is associated with resurrections. The number 5 with grace. The number 15 is the product of 3 times 5. There are three resurrections of the righteous and they all occur on the 15th day of the month. The righteous are saved by grace. This is what the heavens look like at dawn on the 15th day of the third month every year. This is a view from Jerusalem, looking south and east. Circled are the constellations of the rapture. They involve Aries, which in Hebrew is Tale, meaning lamb, representing Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. To the right of Aries is Pisces, the symbol of the Christian, since the beginning has been the fish. The early Christians were called Pisces and Ichthus. The first time Jesus multiplied the fishes and loaves, there were two fishes and five barley loaves. The two fishes represent the Jew and the Gentile. The five barley loaves represent grace. Five is the number of grace in the Bible. The Jew and the Gentile saved by grace. This is why we see two fishes in the heavens. The fishes also represent the dead in Christ who rise first and then we who are alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Did you ever wonder why, when Jesus paid the temple tax, he had Peter cast a line and hook into the sea, and then open the mouth of the first fish he catches and take out the coin in the fish's mouth to pay the temple tax? It's because the fish will become the symbol of the Christian. It's symbolic of the future when Christ will pay for our redemption by his death on the cross. Cetus, the dragon in the sea, represents Satan. The devil who wants to devour the Christian represented by the fish. In that day the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. If you look closely, the band of the fishes is on the neck of the dragon. The Holy Spirit-filled church or Christian is what restrains Satan. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. The Hebrew language, when originally written, was pictographs and pictures. It reads from right to left. When you look at the heavens, what do we see? We see pictures, and they also read from right to left, as you must look south to see these constellations. Taurus represents Christ the Judge, the beginning of the tribulation. The rapture occurs before Christ pours out his judgment upon the world. This is the view of the heavens at dawn from Jerusalem on the 15th day of the third month this year on the Jewish calendar. That's June 15th, 2022. The sun, moon, and planets all travel through the heavens through these constellations staying very close to this yellow arc, which is called the ecliptic. They travel in this direction from right to left just like the written Hebrew language. In the constellations of the rapture, we find the bright morning star, Venus, which we are told in Revelation 22:16 is Jesus. Venus is in the constellation of Aries, Tale in Hebrew, the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jupiter in this scene represents the Christian from the Revelation 12 sign. 
It's in the constellation of Pisces, which represents the Christian, the believer, the church. Mars representing the red dragon is in the constellation of the dragon in the sea, Cetus. Taurus marks the beginning of the tribulation. Venus is beginning to leave Aries and head into the constellation of Taurus, Christ the judge. Two wandering stars, Venus and Mercury and the star Aldebaran form a three-star alignment that precisely matches a three-star alignment found in the Revelation 12 sign. The moon representing both the bride and Messiah is above the tail of the scorpion in the same location as on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. What you see on the left is a Revelation 12 sign at dawn on September 23, 2017. On the right, you see the constellations of the rapture on June 15, 2022. When we overlay the three stars from each day next to each other, we see that they match. The Revelation 12 sign is linked to the day of the rapture in the same way the wave offerings are linked. The first is prophetic of the second. The sheaf of grain waved in the air is prophetic of the full harvest to come on Pentecost when the two loaves are waved in the air, symbolic of the rapture. So too is the Revelation 12 sign, the sign of the soon rapture of the church. The sign reaches its fulfillment when three stars, three being the number of resurrection, align in the constellations of the rapture and the coming judgment. On the same day that Jesus, in the account of the 153 fish, confirms he's coming to take his bride home. The account of the 153 fish only confirms to us the day and month Jesus is coming, but not the year. The Revelation 12 sign tells us the year. 2016, the Lord spoke to me and told me something would happen, and it did, exactly as he told me it would. I shared it with my pastor, and he had it share me with the whole congregation, and I've shared it in multiple videos on my channel. It was by itself a miraculous event, but I always felt there was more, and there is. Just like the typology of Passover, which cannot be understood until it's fulfilled, what happened in November of 2016 could not be understood until the day of the rapture was revealed. Once the day is known, what happened in 2016 confirms, just like the 153 fish confirms, and the Revelation 12 sign confirms, that this will be the day of the rapture. What happened on that day and how it confirms that this will be the day of the rapture can be found in the video link in the upper right hand corner. There are only a few minutes left to this video and I will have another link at the end. The final item I want to talk about is the typology of the rapture that is present in the account of the giving of the law. This is the most powerful type or symbolism of the rapture in the Old Testament. It's the trumpet of God that calls Moses to come up the mountain at the same time God is coming down to meet him. It occurs in the third month. We are not told when in the third month it occurs. But since it's a meeting with God, and the three harvest feasts are meetings with God, and they occur on the 15th day of the month, it's pretty safe to assume it occurs on the 15th day to maintain the typology. They are given three days to prepare and to be ready for the third day. The number three is associated with resurrections in the Bible. The rapture begins with the resurrection of the dead in Christ first, and then we who are alive. I'm going to cover just some of the highlights. It's on the third new moon, which tells us it's the third month. They have three days to prepare and be ready for the third day. They know when God is coming. If this is a type of the rapture, then we should too. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come to the mountain. It's on the morning of the third day that Moses goes up the mountain. In the account of the 153 fish, it's morning, and it was the third time Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud on the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. So at the sound of a very loud trumpet blast, they come out to meet God. Sounds like the rapture. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. 
And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Perfect typology of the rapture. If this is your first time viewing this information, I highly recommend watching all the videos in the playlist shown. In many of the videos, I explain what you see here on this chart. If you watch any videos after watching this one, I would watch the one shown here. Your old men shall dream dreams. It's where I explain what happened on November 5th, 2016, which confirms that this will be the day of the rapture. Thanks for watching. We're all going to meet really soon. God bless.